Think and Grow Rich for the Modern Reader from the original unedited 1937 text by Napoleon Hill, an official production of the Napoleon Hill Foundation. I'm your narrator, Rich Germain. This audiobook provides a synopsis of the original 1937 text of Hill's masterpiece, Think and Grow Rich. It extracts the key principles, instructions, and examples so that the modern professional, regardless of how busy he or she is, can benefit from the timeless wisdom found in Hill's book. To receive the greatest possible benefit from its wisdom, listen to one chapter per day, allowing the space and time to fully digest its insights and to enable your imaginative faculties to act on the thought impulses generated thereby. You will also undoubtedly find your progress magnified by working through this content in the setting of a book club or study group, wherein the mastermind principle can be applied to reach higher level orders of thinking. Regardless of your approach, when you commit yourself to practicing the steps outlined in this audiobook, you will surely open yourself up to great personal growth and momentum toward achieving your dreams. Whatever the mind can conceive and believe, the mind can achieve. Napoleon Hill Publisher's Preface This book conveys the experience of more than 500 men of great wealth who began at scratch with nothing to give in return for riches except thoughts, ideas, and organized plans. Here you have the entire philosophy of money-making, just as it was organized from the actual achievements of the most successful men known to the American people during the past 50 years. It describes what to do, also how to do it. It provides you with a perfect system of self-analysis that will readily disclose what has been standing between you and the big money in the past. It describes the famous Andrew Carnegie formula of personal achievement by which he accumulated hundreds of millions of dollars for himself and made no fewer than a score of millionaires of men to whom he taught his secret. It was written by the man to whom Carnegie disclosed the astounding secret of his riches, the same man to whom the 500 wealthy men revealed the source of their riches. In this volume will be found the 13 principles of money-making essential to every person who accumulates sufficient money to guarantee financial independence. Money and material things are essential for freedom of body and mind. But there are some who will feel that the greatest of all riches can be evaluated only in terms of lasting friendships, harmonious family relationships, sympathy, and understanding between business associates, and introspective harmony, which brings one peace of mind measurable only in spiritual values. All who read, understand, and apply this philosophy will be better prepared to attract and enjoy these higher estates, which always have been and always will be denied to all except those who are ready for them. Be prepared, therefore, when you expose yourself to the influence of this philosophy to experience a changed life, which may help you not only to negotiate your way through life with harmony and understanding, but also to prepare you for the accumulation of material riches in abundance. Author's Preface In every chapter of this book, Mention has been made of the money-making secret which has made fortunes for more than 500 exceedingly wealthy men whom I have carefully analyzed over a long period of years. The secret was brought to my attention by Andrew Carnegie more than a quarter of a century ago. The canny, lovable old Scotsman carelessly tossed it into my mind when I was but a boy. Then he sat back in his chair with a merry twinkle in his eyes and watched carefully to see if I had brains enough to understand the full significance of what he had said to me. When he saw that I had grasped the idea, he asked if I would be willing to spend twenty years or more preparing myself to take it to the world, to men and women who, without the secret, might go through life as failures. I said I would and with Mr. Carnegie's cooperation, I have kept my promise. This book contains the secret 
after having been put to a practical test by thousands of people in almost every walk of life. It was Mr. Carnegie's idea that the magic formula, which gave him a stupendous fortune, ought to be placed within reach of people who do not have time to investigate how men make money, and it was his hope that I might test and demonstrate the soundness of the formula through the experience of men and women in every calling. The secret to which I refer has been mentioned no fewer than a hundred times throughout this book. It has not been directly named, for it seems to work more successfully when it is merely uncovered and left in sight where those who are ready and searching for it may pick it up. That is why Mr. Carnegie tossed it to me so quietly, without giving me its specific name. If you are ready to put it to use, you will recognize this secret at least once in every chapter. I wish I might feel privileged to tell you how you will know if you are ready, but that would deprive you of much of the benefit you will receive when you make the discovery in your own way. A peculiar thing about this secret is that those who once acquire it and use it find themselves literally swept on to success with but little effort, and they never again submit to failure. The secret to which I refer cannot be had without a price, although the price is far less than its value. It cannot be had at any price by those who are not intentionally searching for it. It cannot be given away. It cannot be purchased for money, for the reason that it comes in two parts. One part is already in possession of those who are ready for it. The secret serves equally well all who are ready for it. Education has nothing to do with it. I've never known anyone who was inspired to use the secret who did not achieve noteworthy success in his chosen calling. I have never known any person to distinguish himself or to accumulate riches of any consequence without possession of the secret. From these two facts, I draw the conclusion that the secret is more important as part of the knowledge essential for self-determination than any which one receives through what is popularly known as education. As far as schooling is concerned, many of these men had very little. Henry Ford never reached high school, let alone college. I'm not attempting to minimize the value of schooling, but I'm trying to express my earnest belief that those who master and apply the secret will reach high stations, will accumulate riches, and bargain with life on their own terms, even if their schooling has been meager. Somewhere, as you read, the secret to which I refer will jump from the page and stand boldly before you, if you are ready for it. When it appears, you will recognize it. Whether you receive the sign in the first or the last chapter, stop for a moment when it presents itself, and turn down a glass, for that occasion will mark the most important turning point of your life. As a final word of preparation before you begin the first chapter, may I offer one brief suggestion which may provide a clue by which the Carnegie secret may be recognized? It is this. All achievement, all earned riches, have their beginning in an idea. If you are ready for the secret, you already possess one half of it. Therefore, you will readily recognize the other half the moment it reaches your mind. By Napoleon Hill Chapter 1. Introduction. The Man Who Thought His Way Into Partnership with Thomas A. Edison Truly, thoughts are things, and powerful things at that, when they are mixed with definiteness of purpose, persistence, and a burning desire for their translation into riches or other material objects. A little more than thirty years ago, Edwin C. Barnes discovered how true it is that men really do think and grow rich. His discovery did not come about at one sitting. It came little by little, beginning with a burning desire to become a business associate of the great Edison. One of the chief characteristics of Barnes' desire was that it was definite. He wanted to work with Edison, not for him. 
Observe carefully the description of how he went about translating his desire into reality, and you will have a better understanding of the 13 principles which lead to riches. When this desire, or impulse of thought, first flashed into his mind, he was in no position to act upon it. Two difficulties stood in his way. He did not know Mr. Edison, and he did not have enough money to pay his railroad fare to Orange, New Jersey. These difficulties were sufficient to have discouraged the majority of men from making any attempt to carry out the desire. But his was no ordinary desire. He was so determined to find a way to carry out his desire that he finally decided to travel by blind baggage rather than be defeated. To the uninitiated, this means that he went to East Orange on a freight train. He presented himself at Mr. Edison's laboratory and announced he had come to go into business with the inventor. In speaking of the first meeting between Barnes and Edison years later, Mr. Edison said, He stood there before me looking like an ordinary tramp, but there was something in the expression of his face which conveyed the impression that he was determined to get what he had come after. I had learned from years of experience with men that when a man really desires a thing so deeply that he is willing to stake his entire future on a single turn of the wheel in order to get it, he is sure to win. I gave him the opportunity he asked for, because I saw he had made up his mind to stand by until he succeeded. Just what young Barnes said to Mr. Edison on that occasion was far less important than that which he thought. Edison himself said so. It could not have been the young man's appearance which got him his start in the Edison office, for that was definitely against him. It was what he thought that counted. If the significance of this statement could be conveyed to every person who reads it, there would be no need for the remainder of this book. Barnes did not get his partnership with Edison on his first interview. He did get a chance to work in the Edison offices at a very nominal wage, doing work that was unimportant to Edison, but most important to Barnes, because it gave him an opportunity to display his merchandise where his intended partner could see it. Months went by. Apparently nothing happened to bring the coveted goal which Barnes had set up in his mind as his definite major purpose. But something important was happening in Barnes' mind. He was constantly intensifying his desire to become the business associate of Edison. Psychologists have correctly said that when one is truly ready for a thing, it puts in its appearance. Barnes was ready for a business association with Edison. Moreover, he was determined to remain ready until he got that which he was seeking. When the opportunity came... It appeared in a different form and from a different direction than Barnes had expected. That is one of the tricks of opportunity. It has a sly habit of slipping in by the back door, and often it comes disguised in the form of misfortune or temporary defeat. Perhaps this is why so many fail to recognize opportunity. Mr. Edison had just perfected a new office device, known at that time as the Edison Dictating Machine, now the Ediphone. His salesmen were not enthusiastic over the machine. They did not believe it could be sold without great effort. Barnes saw his opportunity. Barnes knew he could sell the Edison Dictating Machine. He suggested this to Edison and promptly got his chance. He did sell the machine. In fact, he sold it so successfully that Edison gave him a contract to distribute and market it all over the nation. The business alliance has been in operation for more than 30 years. Out of it, Barnes has made himself rich in money, but he has done something infinitely greater. He has proved that one really may think and grow rich. How much actual cash that original desire of Barnes has been worth to him, I have no way of knowing. Perhaps it has brought him two or three million dollars. But that amount, whatever it is, becomes insignificant when compared with the greater asset he acquired in the form of definite knowledge that, in intangible impulse of thought, 
can be transmuted into its physical counterpart by the application of known principles. Barnes literally thought himself into a partnership with the great Edison. He thought himself into a fortune. He had nothing to start with except the capacity to know what he wanted and the determination to stand by that desire until he realized it. Now, let us look at a different situation and study a man who had plenty of tangible evidence of riches but lost it because he stopped three feet short of the goal he was seeking. Three feet from gold. One of the most common causes of failure is the habit of quitting when one is overtaken by temporary defeat. Every person is guilty of this mistake at one time or another. An uncle of R.U. Darby was caught by the gold fever in the gold rush days and went west to dig and grow rich. He had never heard that more gold has been mined from the brains of men than has ever been taken from the earth. After weeks of labor, he was rewarded by the discovery of the shining ore. He needed machinery to bring the ore to the surface, and quietly he covered up the mine, retraced his footsteps to his home in Williamsburg, Maryland, told his relatives and a few neighbors of the strike. They got together money for the needed machinery, had it shipped. The uncle and Darby went back to work the mine. The first car of ore was mined and shipped to a smelter. The returns proved that they had one of the richest mines in Colorado. A few more cars of that ore would clear the debts. Then would come the big killing and profits. Down went the drills. Up went the hopes of Darby and uncle. Then something happened. The vein of gold ore disappeared. They had come to the end of the rainbow, and the pot of gold was no longer there. They drilled on, desperately trying to pick up the vein again, all to no avail. Finally, they decided to quit. They sold the machinery to a junk man for a few hundred dollars and took the train back home. Some junk men are dumb, but not this one. He called in a mining engineer to look at the mine and do a little calculating. The engineer advised that the project had failed because the owners were not familiar with fault lines. His calculations showed that the vein would be found just three feet from where the Darbys had stopped drilling. That is exactly where it was found. The junk man took millions of dollars in ore from the mine because he knew enough to seek expert counsel before giving up. Most of the money which went into the machinery was procured through the efforts of R.U. Darby, who was then a very young man. The money came from his relatives and neighbors because of their faith in him. He paid back every dollar of it, although it was years in doing so. Long afterward, Mr. Darby recouped his loss many times over when he made the discovery that desire can be transmuted into gold. The discovery came after he went into the business of selling life insurance. Remembering that he lost a huge fortune because he stopped three feet from gold, Darby profited by the experience in his chosen work by the simple method of saying to himself, I stopped three feet from gold, but I will never stop because men say no when I ask them to buy insurance. Darby is one of a small group of fewer than 50 men who sell more than a million dollars in life insurance annually. He owes his stickability to the lesson he learned from his quitability in the gold mining business. Before success comes in any man's life, he is sure to meet with much temporary defeat and perhaps some failure. When defeat overtakes a man, the easiest and most logical thing to do is to quit. That is exactly what the majority of men do. More than 500 of the most successful men this country has ever known told the author their greatest success came just one step beyond the point at which defeat had overtaken them. Failure is a trickster with a keen sense of irony and cunning. It takes great delight in tripping one when success is almost within reach. Life is strange and often imponderable. Remember, as you read, 
the answer you may be seeking to the questions which have caused you to ponder over the strangeness of life may be found in your own mind through some idea, plan, or purpose which may spring into your mind as you read. One sound idea is all that one needs to achieve success. The principles described in this book contain the best and the most practical of all that is known concerning ways and means of creating useful ideas. Observe very closely as soon as you master the principles of this philosophy and begin to follow the instructions for applying those principles, your financial status will begin to improve and everything you touch will begin to transmute itself into an asset for your benefit. Impossible? Not at all. One of the main weaknesses of mankind is the average man's familiarity with the word impossible. He knows all the rules which will not work. He knows all the things which cannot be done. This book was written for those who seek the rules which have made others successful and are willing to stake everything on those rules. Success comes to those who become success conscious. Failure comes to those who indifferently allow themselves to become failure conscious. The object of this book is to help all who seek it to learn the art of changing their minds from failure consciousness to success consciousness. Another weakness found in altogether too many people is the habit of measuring everything and everyone by their own impressions and beliefs. Some who will read this will believe that no one can think and grow rich. They cannot think in terms of riches because their thought habits have been steeped in poverty, want, misery, failure, and defeat. You are the master of your fate, the captain of your soul, because. When Henley wrote the prophetic lines, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul, he should have informed us that we are the masters of our fate, the captains of our souls, because we have the power to control our thoughts. He should have told us that the ether in which this little earth floats, in which we move and have our being, is a form of energy moving at an inconceivably high rate of vibration, and that the ether is filled with a form of universal power which adapts itself to the nature of the thoughts we hold in our minds and influences us in natural ways to transmute our thoughts into their physical equivalent. If the poet had told us of this great truth, we would know why it is that we are the masters of our fate, the captains of our souls. He should have told us with great emphasis that this power makes no attempt to discriminate between destructive thoughts and constructive thoughts, that it will urge us to translate into physical reality thoughts of poverty just as quickly as it will influence us to act upon thoughts of riches. He should have told us, too, that our brains become magnetized with the dominating thoughts which we hold in our minds, and by means with which no man is familiar, these magnets attract to us the forces, the people, the circumstances of life, which harmonize with the nature of our dominating thoughts. He should have told us that before we can accumulate riches in great abundance, we must magnetize our minds with intense desire for riches, that we must become money-conscious until the desire for money drives us to create definite plans for acquiring it. But, being a poet and not a philosopher, Henley contented himself by stating a great truth in poetic form, leaving those who followed him to interpret the philosophical meaning of his lines. Little by little, the truth has unfolded itself, until it now appears certain that the principles described in this book hold the secret of mastery over our economic fate. We are now ready to examine the first of these principles. Maintain a spirit of open-mindedness, and remember as you read, they are the invention of no one man. The principles were gathered from the life experiences of more than 500 men who actually accumulated riches in huge amounts, men who began in poverty with but little education, without influence. 
the principles worked for these men. You can put them to work for your own enduring benefit. You will find it easy, not hard, to do.